scientist at the U.S. Geological Survey here in Flagstaff, Arizona, and um, my background is in geology, and my primary interest is in studying volcanoes, active volcanoes. And I'm particularly interested in, in using satellite remote sensing tools to study and monitor active volcanoes. Remote sensing refers to using imaging technology, like specialized cameras, as extensions of our eyes, which allows us to see the world in a new light and in ways that we can't with our eyes alone, and from unique perspectives. So for example, we cannot see the thermal infrared energy that's being emitted by objects that are warm, like these hot springs in Yellowstone National Park. But we can design and build instruments that can see this thermal infrared energy and generate images which give us information about the temperature of distant objects, as in this thermal infrared image of those same hot springs in Yellowstone. So Yellowstone is one of my favorite places, and um, so that's what I want to talk about tonight. I've had, a, I've had the opportunity to do research there for the last several years, and the work that I'm doing there is focused on studying how much geothermal heat is escaping the park. And by geothermal, I mean heat that's generated from within the Earth. How much of that heat is escaping the park, and how is it manifested at the surface, and how does it change with time? Essentially, I'm working on taking Yellowstone's temperature, which is like one of its vital signs. Just like a doctor checks your vital signs when you go for a regular checkup, we monitor volcanoes by checking their vital signs. So for volcanoes, their vital signs are earthquakes. It's like the volcano's heartbeat. And then there's ground deformation. The ground around volcanoes moves up and down. It's like the volcano's breathing. And we check for the emission of gases and chemicals in the waters and the emission of heat. And so the reason that we monitor volcanoes that are not currently erupting, like Yellowstone, it's the same reason you go to the doctor when you're not sick, right? You go for regular checkups, so they can monitor your vital signs under normal conditions. So the purpose of this monitoring in Yellowstone is to establish what is the background, what is normal, so that we know how to recognize abnormal changes should they ever occur. Changes that may be related to impending volcanic activity, or just normal seasonal cycles, or possibly even human activities. Now, there's two things I want to talk about tonight. One is Yellowstone as it is, as we understand it through our observations and our research. And the other is Yellowstone as it is often depicted in the popular press and on the internet and on TV movies and docudramas that they've made about Yellowstone. One thing that I'm very passionate about, in addition to my research, is accurately communicating science and dispelling myths and misinformation about science in general and about Yellowstone in particular. It seems that in the last 10 or 15 years or so, there's been an increasing amount of sensationalism and misinformation and confusion about Yellowstone. And I just, I just can't play, I just can't talk about Yellowstone without playing Mythbuster. So if you don't mind, I'm gonna be Mythbuster here for just a few minutes, all right? Okay. Now, Yellowstone, these days is perhaps best known as being a super volcano. Okay, well there are no photographs of a super volcanic eruption anywhere because the most recent one happened in New Zealand about 26,000 years ago. But it's not that hard to find a, a highly sensationalized depictions of them on the internet, like, like in this image here. But super volcano does have a scientific definition. It is a volcanic center that has, in the past, had an eruption that ejected more than a thousand cubic kilometers of stuff lava and ash out onto the surface. Okay, now that's a lot of stuff. If you take that much stuff from an underground reservoir of magma and erupt it onto the surface, you're going to leave a void space underground, which isn't strong enough to hold up the surface. And so the surface will collapse into this void. And that is called a caldera. And these eruptions are called large caldera forming eruptions. It's like a giant sinkhole. And it's important to know that it's a collapse feature, not an explosion feature. 
as is often depicted in some of the, the really sensationalized media, movies and, and docudramas. The analogy that I like to use is this. Imagine a waterbed filled with water and covered with a whole bunch of layers of dirt and mud and sand. Now imagine puncturing a hole in part of the waterbed, maybe puncturing two or three holes in it. All the water is going to come jetting out these two or three holes, but the entire thing is going to deflate, and the ground above it is going to collapse into it. That's how a caldera forms. Now, the caldera that formed after the last super eruption in Yellowstone is called the Yellowstone Caldera. It formed in about 631,000 years ago. It's really big. It's about 75 kilometers long and 45 kilometers wide. And it's a pretty good reflection of how big we think the magma reservoir was that emptied during that eruption. But it almost certainly did not look like this image on the left as it was erupting. But these eruptions are big, there's no doubt about it. And one of the really um, interesting and fascinating things about Yellowstone that, that's not an exaggeration and it's not a myth is that of the three out of the five or six biggest eruptions that have ever happened in Earth history that we know about, three of them have come from this place. That's pretty incredible. Just over two million years ago, there was a really big eruption there that left what's called the Island Park Caldera. There's still remnants of that out there. And then again, 1,285,000 years ago, there was another eruption, not as big, but still really big. It left what's called the Henry Swart Caldera. And then, 631,000 years ago, there was the most recent super eruption in Yellowstone, which resulted in the formation of the Yellowstone Caldera. Now, many of you have probably heard or read online that these super eruptions happen at regular intervals every 600,000 years, and that, therefore, we are either due or overdue for another super eruption. That's one of those myths that I wanted to dispel. The next time you hear somebody say that, you can say, Okay, let's do the math. To do the math, you need the numbers. Here are the numbers. If you do the math, you'll find out that the average time interval between eruptions is actually about 714,000 years. And so we're still about 80,000 years away from a time when we might consider saying Yellowstone's due for another big one. But there's an even bigger problem with this calculation, and that is it is statistically meaningless and scientifically indefensible to try to predict a recurrence interval from just two data points. This does not pass muster. And besides, volcanoes don't erupt at regular predictable intervals anyway. They sort of have a mind of their own. So hopefully that myth is busted. All right? <laughs> Take my myth buster outfit off. OK, good. Now, a few years ago, I was contacted by a producer um, in London who was working on a Discovery Channel documentary about Yellowstone. And they were interested in how I used Thermal infrared remote sensing to study the park. And I thought to myself, cool, and I get to be on the Discovery Channel. And so, sure enough, they, they flew me up to the park and they spent a full day interviewing me and filming me, walking around, and answering questions on camera. And um, it was a really interesting and, and inter educational experience for me. Now, before I went, I spent some time preparing. I am well aware that scientists have a reputation for not being very good communicators of their science to broad public audiences. Frankly, it's a well-deserved reputation. But one that I, I think, I hope, is getting better. Personally, I spend a lot of my time thinking about how to improve science communication. Not just to my colleagues, not just to school children, but to essentially everyone. Anyone who's willing to listen. So thank you all for listening. <laughs> so I prepared some good sound bites, because I know that's what's going to make it onto the show. right? Not some long-winded, complicated explanation that's, that's full of scientific jargon and math. Sound bites. So that's what I did. When they asked me questions, I gave them all my best lines. And, and I thought to myself, what a great opportunity this is to dispel some of the myths and misinformation about Yellowstone. Well, none of my good, what I thought were good sound bites made it onto the show. You've heard of 15 minutes of fame. How about 15 seconds? They cut down all my bits to a little bit less than 15 seconds, and, and that's OK. But the only thing that I said that made the cut was a line that they had pre-written for me to say about how big the caldera is, which I just told you a few minutes ago. Now, interestingly, what they initially asked me to say was this, that the caldera is so big you can see it from space. That's another one of those myths. First of all, I said, that doesn't mean the same thing it used to mean. I mean, nowadays we can see cars from space. Now, to say that something is so big you can only see it from space, that is meaningful. But unfortunately, for the Yellowstone caldera, it's just not true. And this is because since the caldera formed, 
this giant sinkhole in the ground has been mostly filled in by subsequent eruptions. It's like the hole has been partly spackled over. In fact, the caldera was originally discovered in map by old school boots on the ground, rock banging, geologic mapping. Well, that didn't make the cut. The other interesting thing was that they had sort of an agenda, a narrative that they were sort of funneling me into, and it was about the supervolcano. Every time I said Yellowstone, they said, say supervolcano. <laughs> and eventually I was like, listen, Yellowstone's not just a supervolcano, okay? It's also a volcano, or rather a field of a whole bunch of volcanoes. And what I mean by that is since the last super eruption, 631,000 years ago, there have been about 80 volcanic eruptions that were, well, not so super. These are mostly lava dome and lava flow eruptions, many of which were not even that explosive. And the most recent one was 70,000 years ago. So to say Yellowstone is a super volcano is true, but it's not the whole story. In fact, if Yellowstone were to ever erupt again, it's much more likely to be one of these lava dome or lava flow eruptions, which would affect activities in the park, but not, not really much weight beyond that. And so, well, that didn't make the cut either. <laughs> but I don't mean to criticize them. They were a really great crew. The film and production crew were really cool, fun, very professional, fun to hang out with, and the show turned out well. It's called X-Ray Yellowstone, and it's really interesting, and it's, it's entertaining, and that's the purpose of those shows. The point I'm trying to make here is that you don't need to exaggerate Yellowstone or tell just the most extreme parts of the story to make it exciting and compelling. It's exciting and compelling just as it is. Just as it is. So what is it? It's a national park, as you know. It was founded in 1872, making it the world's first national park. And the reason it's a national park is because of the geothermal features. It contains the largest geothermal system in the world. Again, geothermal means earth heat, or heat generated from within the earth. All volcanoes and geothermal areas exist simply because it's hot down there. The inside of the earth is hot, and these are just the places at the surface where the earth is letting out a lot of its heat. Now, Yellowstone contains more than 10,000 unique geothermal features, like mud pots and steam vents, which are also called fumaroles. And of course, the famous, very colorful hot springs. And of course, the geysers. You know, geysers are just a, a special type of a hot spring that occasionally launch hot water and steam high into the air. There are only about 1,000 geysers on Earth. Half of them are in Yellowstone. That's pretty amazing. Now, this is a map of Yellowstone, which shows the location of all the thermal areas in red. They tend to be located along structures like faults and other natural geologic boundaries. Many of them are located deep in the backcountry and not easily accessible. Now, this map was originally made by really detailed field mapping, which took decades. And so one, one of the, the, some of the work that I'm doing with the remote sensing data is focused on sort of trying to assess and update this map and also augment this map adding information to it. So for example, this is the same thermal area map derived using satellite thermal infrared remote sensing data. It doesn't contain the same level of spatial detail, but there's a lot more information here. So now, instead of having a map that just shows where the thermal areas are, we have a map that shows where the hottest parts of the thermal areas are and where the cooler parts of the thermal areas are with quantitative information about how much heat is, is coming out, how much heat they're giving off. I've been able to map some thermal areas that hadn't been included on this original map. And I can tell the difference between thermal areas that are still actively producing a lot of heat and other thermal areas which have cooled down but are still producing a lot of gas. Now this is important not just for monitoring a potentially active volcanic system, but from the perspective of the Park Service, it's important for supporting decisions in the park about development of infrastructure, like where do you build roads and trails? Where should you not build roads and trails? and for the protection of park resources and for visitor safety. And now that we have established and have a really good idea of what the thermal background is, we can start looking for changes. And so one really exciting recent development in satellite remote sensing was the launch of the Landsat 8 satellite. Since 2013, Landsat 8 has been acquiring thermal infrared images over the park every 16 days, during the nighttime when you can see the thermal areas more clearly. And this is really a, a capability that we've never had before. We get frequent, regular, consistent, moderate spatial resolution, nighttime thermal infrared images over the entire park. And so this is great for being able to try to find changes. So this is a, 
animated sequence of uh, temperature anomaly changes in an area called Norris Geyser Basin, which is one of the hotter and more dynamic areas in the park. This is a, a temperature anomaly map showing changes through time. So it's not, a, it's not giving you absolute temperature values, they're relative temperature values, or, or temperature values above background. And as you can see, sometimes it's cloudy. If you look at this over and over like I have, you, you detect some seasonal patterns to the change. But if there were any really significant changes, either spatially or in the, the magnitude of the temperature uh, anomaly, then you'd be able to see it. And so the point is that we can now generate these, these time, temperature data time series maps for any area of the park. And this is a great tool for trying to detect subtle changes. And now we can start tackling bigger questions like, is Yellowstone heating up? Or is it cooling down? Or is it staying the same? We really need many more years of this level of monitoring data to be able to answer that question. And there are other big questions that we don't yet know the answers to, like, will it ever erupt again? If so, when? What type of eruption might it be? How will it recognize the warning signs? We don't know the answers to these questions sufficiently, but we have some good ideas. It would be an exaggeration to say that we have no idea or that we're clueless just because no one's ever seen a super eruption. No, we have some good ideas based on the monitoring do, we do uh, for volcanoes all, all elsewhere in the world. We know what has to happen for a volcano to erupt. We know what the precursor warning signs look like. We know what non-precursor reactivity looks like in Yellowstone. It's what it's been doing for decades. But we don't know the answers to these with enough certainty. And that's one of the things that's so exciting about it, right? Because I don't know is what drives science. And so it's only through the regular monitoring and research that we're doing now that we'll ever be able to find out the answers to these questions. And so again, thank you for listening.